Um, our second lesson is from the Gospel of Luke. It's from chapter 5, and it's verses 1 through 11. Listen for what the Spirit has to say to the church. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night long and we've caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll be catching people. When they brought their boats to shore... They left everything, and they followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Grab a partner. I bet you're scared for a second. If you're an introvert, those are not words you love to hear. When I finished seminary in 2009, I was looking for my first call as, as a pastor of a church, and it uh, was during a recession. And for economic reasons, churches were actually letting people go, uh, or not refilling, especially associate positions, and a lot of pastors were staying where they were because they didn't want to try to leave during a recession. So it took nine months to find my first call. So seeing that I had time on my hands, and I was probably going to have it, I started accepting some court-ordered mediations, what I used to do, and I also took a five-week-long residential yoga teacher training program in St. Augustine at Discovery Yoga there. Twelve other students. So when you practice yoga in a normal class, maybe, um, maybe a number of you have gone to at least one yoga class in your life, you know you, you're not interacting with any other students at any time. And so that was pretty much what I was hoping for, a nice rest after seminary. There would be like kind of an inward journey kind of thing. And um, I was shocked that there was turned out to be community life. And uh, so during yoga teacher training, now grab a partner, was always coming out of the teacher's mouth. So you, you got a partner to practice a pose you're working on, let's say triangle pose or downward dog or whatever you're working on, you'd practice it together. Or you'd get together in twos or even threes, that's called a triad. Um, when you get together and you maybe talk about anatomy, because we learned about the spine and about muscles and about um, all kinds of things that a yoga teacher should know, in order to make sure people don't hurt themselves and to understand what poses do. So all the time, grab a partner. Now everyone at some time has heard these words. I'm quite sure that during school, whether it was lower school or higher education or perhaps a retreat, a man's retreat, a woman's retreat, a co-ed retreat, a Sunday school class, a small group, um, Oh, the corporate outing or law firm outing kind. Oh, uh, grab a partner and now like fall into their arms and let them catch you. So you know what it's like when someone says grab a partner and um, either you're looking down, so not to make eye contact, 
or you're looking around nervously, or you're trying to see that person you actually like, or um, sometimes you have to pretend that's the time you need to go to the restroom. <laughs> and if you don't know anybody, all the more terrifying. So like it or not, grab a partner. Maybe you're like happy to hear those words. Maybe you're not so much. It is a biblical theme, and that's our theme for today. It is a huge biblical theme. It's part of what happens when you belong to God and you find out you belong to all these other people too. So if you participate in church life and you do anything besides coming to worship, you'll soon see this partner thing getting going. You'll have to interact with other people. And after a while, you might even figure out you belong to the church worldwide. Like you belong to people in other places that you've never met. You belong to people that don't speak your language um, and they don't speak yours. And they uh, live in completely different places. They don't eat the same kind of bread as you. So today's story begins with a man who is working alone. And he's been working alone for a while. And if you read the first part of any of the Gospels, you can watch him and what it's like to work alone. Of course, I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan, and then he spent 40 days alone, no other human being anyway, in the wilderness. And then he comes out of the wilderness, and he's extremely excited about sharing what uh, God has given him to share with the world, and he is ready to go, but he's working alone. And as we approach the story this morning, we see that he is by himself. And maybe you can imagine in your, in your mind what it is like to have one person and then the crowd is pressing in on him. And I'm sure that was probably hundreds of people, don't you think, there in Capernaum? And so he is standing by the Lake of Gennesaret. That's another phrase for the Sea of Galilee. And the crowd's pressing in on him. And uh, last night, or the night before, sometime recently, he had dinner at Simon Peter's house. At least there was that. He interacted there personally and uh, fixed up his mother-in-law from her fever. So today he's standing by the Sea of Galilee, I think in Capernaum, and he is noticing things. I think he's got a plan, don't you? He sees two boats on the shore. Notice two the boats are empty because the fishermen are out of both boats. They're cleaning their nets. That's what you do after you finish fishing because there's usually junk in the nets. Apparently no fish, but other stuff. So Jesus decides to borrow Simon Peter's boat. I just feel like this is all so planned out. It's just like so beautiful to watch. And he asks him to move his boat a little far out. And then he gets in his boat and his voice can carry across the water and teach from the boat. And after the lesson is over, Jesus says to Simon Peter, go on out in the deep water and go ahead and cast your nets. And Peter protests, well, that sounds like so many of us, especially me, okay. But he goes and there are so many fish. And so Peter and his crew signal to the people in the other boat I'm not sure it's out there yet. They have to maybe push it out or maybe it's already out there and they come and help. And again, there's so many fish that they have to stop casting the nets because the boats are about to sink. Now everyone, it says, is are in awe because this literally never happens. They're thinking, this must be a God thing. So Peter... Simon Peter feels undeserving, undeserving to the point of like freaking out almost. He's positive he has done nothing to deserve this abundance. He falls to his knees at the feet of Jesus and says, I'm unworthy, I'm sinful. Like, don't even come near me, I, I, I don't deserve this. But Jesus is grabbing some partners today. And he says the words so famous now, uh, don't worry, 
in the future, you're going to be fishing for people. And so the brothers from the two boats leave everything, it says. I hope they brought the fish to the market and didn't leave that for their families. But they left everything and followed him. Working with partners is not everybody's cup of tea. And um, sometimes we don't even get to choose them. But today's story is all over the idea of working with partners. And that theme will grow bigger and bigger and bigger as the ministry gets going, you know, and as the church gets started and as um, this thing starts going worldwide. There's no doubt about it, God wants us to grab partners and be grabbed. So for one thing, grabbing a partner is practical. Um, God is always providing abundantly more than we can handle ourselves. And so to share that abundance, we have to have help. We have to have helpers and be helpers. And you might remember that today's story about too many fish, you're like, wasn't there a story we heard recently like that? Yeah, there was one at the end of John after the resurrection. There's a story like this. There's this abundance when you're around Jesus. And then there's the time that Jesus fed those thousands of people out there on the grass and needed his disciples to pass things out and then to pick up the 12 baskets of leftovers. And back in the stories of the Old Testament, we remember, uh, remember Moses' father-in-law and how he uh, came to where Moses was and saw what he was doing and said, look, you're going to like die early if you don't get some help. Pick out some partners to do your work with you. So grace is overflowing in the world. That's how I see it. It's overflowing in our lives, and we must have help to share it. And that's why we work together in mission and ministry in the church. And so um, I, I like that idea of singing that song in different parts. Thank you, Vernon. And thank you, um, choir, for showing us how partnership works today in a special way. Uh, it worked on the work day, the trunk, and tr trunk or treat, uh, all kinds of things we do together. Almost everything is in partnership. So I'll do it myself is not practical in the church. And if you're um, somehow connecting the dots to your own life, I'm pretty sure this whole message applies to our lives in general. But it can be um, tempting to do it all yourself. And I'm saying, I'm thinking maybe it's not because I'm an introvert that I cringe when someone says grab a partner sometimes. It could be shyness for some people. It could be feeling inadequate like Simon Peter felt, like I don't think I can contribute anything. Not true. Or it could be, close your ears as if it's you, wanting to have things done your own way. Okay. Grabbing a partner is practical and it's also very spiritual. As Cece and Chuck read from the book of Ecclesiastes, um, let's see, about the two are better than one in all the different ways and then a threefold cord just cannot be broken. Um, and that reminds me so much of what Jesus said in Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. So in my study this week, I noticed Luke uses the word partner two different times. Maybe you picked up on that two times in this passage. And he uses two different Greek words, actually, Luke. We heard one English word. And the first time, that word has a, a root that means partaking together, sharing together, and so forth. And the second one he uses is the word related to koinonia. Most, if you've gone to Bible studies and things like that, you know koinonia is kind of a spiritual word. It means um, a deeper sharing, a deeper relationship, a sharing in Christ. So, grab a partner. 
Our rumor didn't work alone very long. I don't know how many days that was, but I'll bet it wasn't that long. He had partners. Those partners chose other partners. Sometimes Jesus chose them a partner, and he's still doing that today. And our theology says that Christianity is not a me and Jesus thing, really. It is, but it's an us thing. It's always a sharing. It's always a common partaking. That's so hard for me to remember sometimes, that our salvation and our service is a shared grace. It's a shared thing. So in closing, um, for me, I want to think of one big example. There's a lot around the church here that we can think of, but one big example that's very current right now, and that is Presbyterian disaster assistance. And that's a part of our denomination. It's one of the agencies of our denomination. So this is how the partnership works with PDA. In recent days, even before Hurricane Helene made landfall, and I know this from working in the Presbytery office over many hurricanes for 10 years, they connect all the presbyteries on calls or Zoom now and uh, talk about the preparation, what's coming and what each needs. They also work with the emergency organization, the main one in each area. Now they're in the midst of helping in the places that have been hurt. They work with presbyteries, churches, and other organizations, both uh, nonprofits and governmental, to directly address people's needs. They visit, they look and listen, they provide emergency assistance and money to even to church workers, like let's say, um, let's say Pam's house had the roof torn off or she couldn't come to work. They provide assistance to church workers through grants and they specialize in long-term recovery. So I remember after Hurricane Irma, PDA, uh, granted funds in Jacksonville area to an entity that helped seniors replace their roofs that had come off in the storm. And these seniors um, qualified because a roof, let's say it was 15 or $20,000, was more than they received to live on in a year. So they would have to have left their house. And their funds were matched with funds from a lot of different nonprofit, mainly organizations, and also a local law firm. So having worked on pres with pres presbytery staff during a lot of different storms, I am positive that PDA is a wonderful place to send um, contributions to. But they actually, um, they have on their website what you do when something like this happens is, is you give and you pray. And that's a partnership that we have in um, people that are hurting right now. And God forbid, all of that is starting over right now. And I'm sure PDA is on it. So grab a partner and be grateful to God when you can be one. And partner work is what God does. It's, it's kind of who God is if you think about that triad, the Trinity. So today, uh, as we come to the table in a few moments, we rejoice in this good news in a special way. I think it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said this, the fellowship of the Lord's Supper is where our joy in Christ and in our common community is complete. Because we come to this table with everyone who's ever loved Jesus, has gone to heaven and loves Jesus there, will love Jesus, or presently is one of his. To God be the glory. Amen.